Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. We have once again missed uh, Lynette Zhang as our esteemed guest, as returning guest, and we're very excited to have her to talk all things financial in the new landscape in which we are finding ourselves. Again, if you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow and smash that subscribe button for uh, all personalized updates. As you remember, Ms. Lynette Zhang has nearly 60 years in the financial marketplace uh, with a heavy concentration on precious metals and community living and self-preservation. So we are honored to have her once again, Ms. Lynette Zhang. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, John. I really appreciate being here. Likewise, it's a privilege to have you and your subject matter expertise. So as I was talking to you offline, we've um, our team has cooked up what I believe are some really good, compelling questions, at least some meaty uh, subject matter for both of our respective audiences. So let's start at the top. Um, something that obviously you talk a great deal about on your podcast, uh, which is to say we see the Federal Reserve they started by saying, well, it's just going to be one rate cut. And then we know they lie because, like you said, it's not what they say, it's what they do. They've done an about face and recapitulated to now talking about three rate cuts for September, October, and November. And therefore, we know they can't be trusted. Um, so the question is, are we in the bust from your chart analysis? And are they in the process of just destroying their old system? Well, well 100% because the system is really dead already. It died in 2008. And so all of this is really a setup and, and especially what I'm seeing right now, particularly in the banking sector. Yeah, this is absolutely a setup for the next crisis. And I'm not convinced that some of the stuff that's going on like uh, the IT outage or what have you, is that a test? Right? Is that about getting people comfortable with the outage and just seeing how what the reaction is? And, and I don't know, that could just be an update, but it clearly shows people, in my opinion, that number one, you cannot get rid of cash because when the systems don't work, they'll work. And so there are signs up cash only, but wait a minute, they wanna take us full digital. So that's a problem, but we're also seeing that my old saying, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Mm -hmm. So your first line of defense is cash. Your second line of defense is your barterable physical gold and silver in fractional form or in basic form outside of the system. And yeah, I mean, that should be clear to everybody now. I don't know that it is, but it should be. Agreed. But as you know, it takes... There's a lot of cognitive dissonance out there in the whole of the society, so we have to sometimes repeat these these narratives over and over to reinforce it to your point, but um, I kind of suspected you would say that, but again, it just helps engender the, the repetitive refrain that's necessary. Um, so, so this will be, Lynette, a two-part question because it's kind of in the same scope of things. We clearly see President Trump's going to win this year, and he's talking about removing income tax as well as tax on tips. Additionally, you see him talking about becoming the Bitcoin president and restoring the gold standard. As you may have seen, Judy Shelton is kind of popping up again. We talked about her before uh, as gold returning the standard tied to the new monetary policy, which is certainly uh, encouraging and a step in the right direction. Um, do you think that we will see the um, bust occur this year and carry over into the early part of next year? Well, number one, um, I don't necessarily think that Donald Trump as a president is an absolute given. So mm -hmm. we'll have to really see who ends up in that position. Uh, I do personally have a lot of respect for Judy Shelton uh, and her position on a gold standard. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as that's concerned now, do I think that it's going to happen this year? Look, I'm going to tell you, the system is so darn fragile that it could happen at any moment, regardless of what those in power want. There are way too many things that are going on in the fintech area, in the in the ability of the bigger banks. I mean, they're they're they, none of them pass their living wills, even though all of them pass the stress test, which was a joke. So it is an election year, and, and under normal circumstances, I would say that we will probably get past this election before any major crisis evolves. And I certainly think we're very, very close. 
but but again what we don't know is what is that one teeny piece it's like an avalanche right you get all of this build up of snow build up build up build up build up and then it's just one little teeny weeny snowflake that then creates this massive avalanche and i'm seeing this major build up of risk and danger inside of the entire global financial system whether we're talking about china with all those banks being absorbed by the bigger ones which is the same thing that we've been doing here right i love how they always point fingers look at what they're doing what they're doing what they're doing yeah gotta look in the mirror we're doing the same darn thing and so what that's really done everywhere in the world frankly is concentrated the risk and because we are in an ample reserve regime um, the banks don't have the reserves and hey they all pass the stress test so hey let's buy back more shares let's send out all sorts of dividends and send that money out of this very vulnerable banking system that is so flipping underwater going back to the interest rates right let me just grab my little chopstick here you know for those viewers just as a reminder these are interest rates this is the market value of the bond and when they push those interest rates up all of those uh, 15 years of accumulation of bonds at zero interest rate as well as all of the other debt the mortgages the car loans everything is significantly and severely underwater okay so when you talked about the pivot right i mean what wall street is like applauding and going to even greater overvaluation levels even though these markets are at the highest value valuation levels ever real estate at the highest valuation ever well let me tell you, when they do start lowering those rates, whether it's September, October, November, next year, whenever it is, it, <laughs> it, it won't be a good thing. The, the central banks are between a rock and a hard place because when they do with already overvalued, overinflated markets, you know, a tree does not grow to the sky. It just makes everything a whole lot more vulnerable. I can't tell you that it's going to be Tuesday morning at 8.35 when this whole thing implodes, but it could be. You, you got to be prepared. And when do you want to know about it? And when do you want to get prepared for it? I can sleep at night because my portfolio is prepared and I have food, water, energy, security, barterability, which for me is silver, and, and food, all of this food stuff behind but um, wealth preservation for anything that you're choosing to hold in the system as well as community has become arguably again the most important factor because we just don't have that luxury of time when you ask me when i don't know when but i can tell you i don't like what i'm seeing it's all the earmarks of the next crisis and last week and it's still going on could be a test or it could push us in. And, and if all your wealth is held in the system and the system goes down, well, that's a pretty good excuse for saying, nope, can't have your money back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't work, traders went home. Oops. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Lynette. I think it is a test. And I also think it's to your point about the Fed projection, like don't look here, look over here while we do this, you know, keep you distracted, right? Um, the other reason I asked you the question, Lynette, about President Trump is because I asked this question uh, to a fellow person that we both respect, Greg Manorino, a few weeks ago. Right. And he felt largely about that President Trump would be picked primarily because the uh, Treasury slash Fed and Wall Street would be supporting a move for him for artificial stability to continue to pump up those, those QE rates, which would in essence would be taking down, as you know, the old system. So that's why I want to kind of get your take on it. So thank you for that. Um, now here's part two of the, uh, sorry. Next point though, too, things look very different two weeks ago than they do today. So I'm not, I'm not so sure we're just going to have to see, but to be honest with you, I don't think it matters who gets elected. 
Um, I would like to see Judy Shelton's hand in this because we need a sound money strategy. Yeah. We really do. And, and she does know that mm-hmm. uh, and that part. And she's got some great ideas around that. Uh, but, um, and I love Rick. I mean, he and I have a mutual admiration society. We love him. We love each other. Yes, I've seen you guys in action before, so I can attest to that. And um, no, I agree with you. Ultimately, the whole overarching point of this, as you well know, Annette, is regardless of who's in uh, figurehead power, if we are positioned opposably against whatever they want to do, we're still, uh, we become our own central bank. And then it doesn't really matter what they do because we're going the opposite direction, right, to a safe, safe to shore. But I would say that I think President Trump is more apt to pick Judy Shelton than the alternative. And I think that's why you're seeing her, because it's a foretelling of, of what's coming. So to the second part of the question, Lynette, we, um, we also know he's a Bitcoin president, a crypto president now. Uh, as you know, there's a major Bitcoin conference this week. I think it's uh, tomorrow in Nashville to the 27th. Um, and I know that you've kind of been looking to see the crypto market be more proven or be more solidified from the last time we, we talked. Um, do you think that that is a, another step in the right direction of, of bringing in or ushering in cryptos with respect to the new digital economic reality, specifically backed by physical assets? Well, I, I definitely am seeing a move to back up by physical assets, but quite honestly, unless it can be actually converted into those physical assets, mm-hmm. what does backing mean? It, it, it doesn't mean anything. It, 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 it's about getting you comfortable with it. And mm-hmm. um, I definitely do think that Bitcoin, everybody knows my opinion on this. Um, I don't, I just don't think it was a coincidence of its timing when it came out in January of 2009 versus when quantitative easing came out in March. So I do think that it's a a Trojan horse, so to speak, because you've got to get adoption. And the way that they make these transitions from one to the other is by keeping things appearing to be as normal as possible. And that normalcy kind of changes over time if you just step back and think about what things looked like in 2007 or even 2019. Um, and, And I bring up 2019 because at that time, and this goes into the Trump trade as well, we had the rise in populism, right? With on a global basis, people rising up political unrest because they're losing confidence in those that are in power and in their monetary system. And it was interesting because I just did a piece on it. So I looked at it and I pulled data uh, from a little bit more than a year ago, May 23rd of 2023, where there were 400 geopolitical Um, incidences with the public rising against the governments. And guess what it was as of June 27th? 700 of those same geopolitical instances. So this is the public rising up against the politicians and against the system, almost doubled in a little bit more than a year. That, when I saw that, first of all, I was shocked. And second of all, there is a revolution that's happening. I mean, it is happening and it's the public rising up. And that's why I talk about a quiet and peaceful revolution Mm -hmm. by converting what they can create at the push of a button, fiat money, government debt-based money, that's what it is, that they can value and do at will, just convert that garbage into sound money, physical gold, and physical silver in your possession. Mm -hmm. It's key. And do it sooner than later, because what are you waiting for? Yeah, I agree. It's a lot like in military parlance. If you're in a battlefield and you've got landmines, you want to make sure you're on the other side of it and not standing in front of it when it goes off. So, yeah, absolutely. And, And I remember our last podcast that you were talking about, as the people rise up, it gives us more of a seat at the table. So based on what you've just said, that's an encouraging sign, I would say, right? Um, Exactly. 
So thank you for that. You know, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because again, that dovetails to another question I had. I've heard you talk a lot about, and we talked about this before, so it gives us another continuation on the subject because it's a multi-facet one. Right. Heard you made mention of Zimbabwe and several of your podcasts. We touched on it last time. As you know, Zimbabwe does have the gold, and they're moving to the new Zig bonds aggressively with the gold standard, which you recognized. They also have a new president incoming. It looks like in August, September, Nelson Chamisa who's an ardent Christian who's set to take over and pledges to return the gold standard to all of the bonds and currencies. And it looks like they're gonna utilize digital token assets to deploy it. So the question is, wouldn't it make sense that a preeminent force such as Zimbabwe with the gold um, would, would be related to BRICS? We know they have a big conference coming up October, roughly hundred nations comprising of, I don't know, somewhere between 70% of the world's population. Could they be using the XRP or Stellar Lumens ledger on the DLT to, as you say, liquidate it or marry it? Um, well, it, you know, first of all, anything is possible, and I don't get to be in any of those meetings. I wish that I was. Um, but yes, they are doing a lot more with, with asset backing and the BRICS. I mean, we are definitely seeing a divergence between the East and the West. This isn't a new one. This is one that's just been growing and growing. Um, it'll be interesting to see, though, because every single country has a gold revaluation account. And every single country right now is drowning in the debt to create this garbage. You know, when we're looking at Zimbabwe, I think Zimbabwe is showing what's going to work and what's not, but they still are having trouble with adoption because you really can't take the gold out of the system. And quite honestly, they've made it at least up until the last time or at the point where I looked at it the last time, which I look at that pretty regularly. So unless something has changed just recently, mm -hmm. still can't convert it which means that they can say anything they want, and they certainly do, not just in Zimbabwe, I'm just talking about governments and central banks in sure. general, because their job is to regain that confidence of the public. That's why they're doing the gold, right? I mean, that, that's why. And right. they brought out the physical gold coins for those that could afford it. The rest of the population gets the digital gold. They are building their gold reserves. So it, it's, I'm just watching because honestly, until they can get the population to trust the currency in the system again, they've got bupkis. And for me personally, I wouldn't trust it until I can walk in with this or even any digital asset and walk out with this because this is your ability to do that is what creates that fiscal responsibility. That, that's what does it. And so, the fact that they can all, and I mean all governments, all central banks, have that gold revaluation account, they've already put in place those overnight resets, right? This mm -hmm. is Zimbabwe's sixth currency. So they tried the other way, didn't work. Now they're trying this way. And from what I can see, yes, they are pushing it hard. Um, but I'm not sure that they're getting the, the adoption that they're looking for yet, that that remains to be seen. I know I wouldn't trust it until I could convert it to this. Sure, no, absolutely. And and I agree with you on the dilemma. We, we believe in our team, Linda, which is why I want to talk to you about and kind of go you know, in a deeper marrow dive, is that Putin, who's largely running the BRICS, right, is going to be the one to adopt it and help that conversion because they are so obviously themselves heavily gold laden. I haven't checked the numbers lately, but at last I checked, they were a seventh or eighth in the world in currency reserves and something like fourth or fifth in gold production or, or assets like China. So mm -hmm. I think they're going to um, be a proponent of helping Zimbabwe make that adoption to get to the place that I agree with you. They, we all want them to be and ourselves respectively. Let's, um, let's push back or deviate back a little bit onto the metal side since you've touched on it. Here's a question I've been thinking about, kind of coming at it from sort of a reverse engineering angle. We see the emerging trend of AI in every aspect of our lives, from manufacturing, robotics, everyday jobs, to waitressing and customer service. A good example would be in Japan. They're already utilizing this technology in every aspect of society. I've seen videos, Lynette, where they have actual robotic waitresses replacing human ones. 
What does this mean for the everyday person in terms of AI technology being a threat to their existence? And also, what does it do to the cost of silver since we know most AI and robotics manufacturing comprises mostly of silver? Yeah, um, th there's a lot of really good stuff in there and a lot, AI is not done yet in its evolution. Um, and do I see that occurring? I mean, yes, when you've got California that's paying, what, 20 or $25 an hour for somebody that works at McDonald's, I mean, yeah. that's going to be a problem because now you're pricing the lower priced customer out of being able to buy a Big Mac. I mean, I don't think that'd be the worst thing in the world because that stuff is pure garbage anyway. But, yeah. uh, you know, to your point, that there will be uh, areas that AI completely takes over. But what bothers me more than that, frankly, is the surveillance pricing that a lot of companies, including McDonald's and including Wendy's, <coughs> but that technology where they track all of your habits, where you go, they, they know your bank account. So when you're buying something, how do you know that you're, I mean, this isn't, and it hasn't been, this is not a supply and demand market. Wall Street is not supply and demand, it's a trading market, and the prices that we all pay for food and water and, and all of the necessities is not based upon supply and demand, it's based on Wall Street traders. And so I can see the good in that technology, I really can, but I can also see the bad in that technology. Mm -hmm. so, while I'm not really concerned that people are going to evaporate and definitely the jobs in the new system are going to be different than the jobs in the old system. And, and that's really always the way that it's been and it's evolved, but they still do need us less and less. And they do need us in those worker areas that you can't do with robotics, right? Right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see some good in it, but I don't like the fact that they're going to determine and put in front of me what my data, because that's what's valuable, is my data, where I go on the internet, what I buy, what my bank account says, how much I can afford. I really don't like corporations determining how much they're going to charge me based on that. Agreed. And, and how do you know? And not to mention the invasion of privacy as well. You know, I mean, like we talked about with with old Glory Bank, you know, so. Yeah. You know, so I think that's one of the ways to mitigate it. But no, you're absolutely right. Um, I just want to uh, circle back on a previous question I asked you about BRICS uh, with respect to the conference they're having in October. The, the question, I guess, would be, Lynn, do you think that that is more of a formality announcement. At that point, do you think they've already done a unified BRICS currency and they're just announcing it October? Or do you think that's like the start of a rollout? This seems to come up like every year, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're it doing does. this meeting. That's always the, the question. And yeah. they keep saying, no, they're not doing, you know, a, a unified currency. What they're really just doing is enabling cross-border border trade that doesn't have to be converted into dollars in order to make that, that conversion um, uh, and do that, do that business. Uh, I do think a lot of this is a formality, and I do think that we aren't really going to know what's going on like ever, and that this is more of a stealth move. And I think that when the real announcement is going to come is when they have completed the new plumbing for the global financial system that is based more on tokenization and the digital assets. Uh, because, because when it'd be more like, how are they testing that? And when is that test complete? Because we've got the, on, on our side, on our uh, ledger in the West, we've got the SWIFT system that is basically becoming obsolete, the global payment system. In the meantime, the BRICS nations have been creating a brand new um, financial system and putting all of those plumbing pieces in place. I have a much bigger concern or paying attention to when this system can be turned off the current system that's ruled by the US and the new system can be turned on with the BRICS 
either way, you got to have some sound money that you can convert into whatever that new system is going to be. I'm not sure that they're ready for that announcement yet, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm not, I don't know how far along that plumbing is in place. And I think that's when we'll get that announcement and it'll come very quickly. Yeah, I agree. I kind of call it, Lynette, uh, in our circle, I call it the stadium switch. You know, like if you, let's say football stadium, you have the old stadium you're in and you see them erecting the new one 400 yards away. And then at the end of the season, they start demoing the old one and they flick the lights on the new one and it's a seamless transition. Done. So, yeah, to your, to your point. Um, one of the other questions since you've been talking about metals, understandably, of course, is... John, can I ask you something, John? Please. How far along do you think they are in this plumbing? I think they're pretty far along. So that... I'm sorry? You have a sense of, of where you think they are in this plumbing? Everything that our team can ascertain as much as we're able, because like you said, we're not at the seat at the direct table, but what we can see through our research, through you know discernmental uh, analysis and prayer and all those different factors, I think it's already done. And I think that this year it's pretty much a formality. And it's like you said, and it's going to carry over into the end of this year and the next year. Okay. So we're so so you don't do you think it's going to be announced in October or do you think it's going they're going to wait until they're really have run through all their testing is really ready to to ship the system next next year would be a reasonable target in my opinion too. Yeah, I mean, I per, if you're asking me personally, I think they've already tested the system. I think it's already been vetted. I think they're going to announce it this year because they have enough nations on board and they have enough of the populace or the population to support it. You know, when you have 70 to 80 percent of the population uh, on board, I think you have enough of a majority. So that would be my hypothesis, you could say. It's going to be so, I mean, could we look at any more interesting times? No, no, we're, we're in the greatest time to be alive, I think, personally. And we can actually do something about it, like you said, to help the people get a seat more predominantly at the table, to your point. Um, so thank you, thank you for asking that. Uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you, since you talked a lot, obviously, about precious metals, let's dissect it down to um, a specific demographic, specifically the baby boomer generation. One of the current concerns I have and our team has is that, you know, my generation, I think, pretty well understands the importance of precious metals. Um, I think the, the 20s and 30s millennials understand crypto and they will become aware of the tokenized asset importance over time when we'll help obviously to mitigate that. But the older generation is a concern to me. I'm thinking more of my parents' generation. Um, I believe the source, of, I could be wrong, but I think it was Market Insider last I looked, they said roughly 45 to 50% of baby boomers ages you know, 65 and up, um, less than 50% of the, that generation has precious metals. Um, what is it that you think in your experience we can do to get more of them to take an avid interest? I mean, they were old enough to see when the gold standards were shifted away from Nixon and Kissinger. So they, they remember their parents being able to go the, to your point, go to the bank, cash out a check and get a percentage of gold and silver. So well, they I'm can't say that. In 1933. Like I'm a baby boomer. I'm going to be 70 in October and I was born in 54. Okay. So I, you know, until Nixon officially took us off the gold standard in 71, it, it still wasn't convertible and it's still really what it was legal. But, it, you know, that's why I do the pre 33s because you could hold as much as you want to and use it in the normal marketplace. Um, but it, it's not so much, and actually uh, people in my generation would have a lot of wedding bands or gold jewelry, not necessarily a lot, but they would have something. It's not my generation that's gonna create the revolution though. It's not my generation that's going to demand that seat at the table. It is that younger demographic, those people, those younger people that have grown up with all of this technology and we just didn't die off fast enough. And what I'm seeing on a global basis that gives me so much hope, oh my gosh, is that younger demographic that is starting to question what's happening because they see the American dream as a lie, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, they're starting to feel it. They're starting to wake up. And 
it's Amazon and it's Costco and it's Walmart and it's in China and it's in South Korea and it's in a whole bunch of other countries where you see the young that you anticipate would have just accepted the cryptocurrency and, and not that they don't accept it to a large degree, but they don't completely accept it. And I'm actually seeing a rise in the younger population and their move toward gold because they see the inflation. They see that the, that their dollars can't buy what they used to buy and they can't make enough with all of that school debt, you know, the tuition debt and all of the debt that they've been encouraged to carry because that's how money's created in this system. I, I think I have so much hope with what I'm seeing that I do think the revolution has already begun. I really do. And I think that those that carry it are college age students. They're, they're that generation and a little bit older, not so much my generation, it's the younger generation. My generation is just because they don't have any money for retirement either. And things aren't going to get cheaper. They're only going to get more expensive. And and I don't know how many really believe, I, I'd be curious to see from your viewers, maybe there's some comments on this, how many people really believe that the Federal Reserve and any of these other global central bankers have conquered the inflation that they created just by all their money printing because that's the only thing that they can do. Right. Oh, good question. Well, we'll have to see, like like you said, what the reaction is on that, and your viewers as well, respectively. So absolutely, a good, good, good litmus, a good litmus test. Um, speaking the perfect segue. Speaking of the Fed, um, we know the Fed and the government lie just about everything, to include the job market, rate of inflation, including the real estate and the bond market. Right, right on cue with what you're saying. Um, now, I, 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 if you don't have the exact answer, I understand, but I would love to get your best educated guess. What do you suppose the real unemployment and real estate numbers are, given that commercial real estate, malls are drying up, houses are sitting for longer periods of time. We see that developers are having to sit on new construction. They're even having to pay off the interest on the homes just to make them affordable for sale. How are people going to buy these homes if they're losing their jobs? That is such a good point, isn't it? The real estate market is so severely overvalued. And while I can't, I, I can give you a blanket answer based on history, right? Sure. Because this is what I think it's gonna look a, a lot more like, like Japan. And in certain areas, believe it or not, real estate prices are still going up. In other areas, they are dropping precipitously, say, you know, San Francisco, um, even in Manhattan in certain areas. And it's also apartment buildings. All of these huge apartment buildings that take years to go through the financial tube and they're building, a lot of them are done in REITs and they and they're having trouble with the financing because of all of that leverage so i do believe that we are going to see residential real estate drop 80 85 percent and commercial drop 90 95 percent i mean that's what history tells us so you know when you put that in perspective am i look you got to have a place to make your last stand so if you need to buy a house because you have to live there and can grow food and and what have you rock and roll hoochie coo it doesn't really matter because part of the sound money strategy is how to pay the, that debt off that fixed rate debt off with dollars that have virtually no value would i speculate on a piece of property now <laughs> not on your life. It's severely overvalued and the opportunities for that will lie ahead. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've seen a pullback. I think uh, I was reading recently where in San Francisco, a lot of this commercial real estate is has dropped like 60% and it's such a big bargain. Just rush right out and buy it. Oh, no, 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 no. It'll go down a lot more. Have a mm -hmm. little patience. Put yeah. that into physical gold actually this would be the form that you would put it into the slabbed form and then sit back and be patient and what we're going to ultimately see is the smart money beginning to accumulate we'll see that accumulation pattern when we see that pattern 
That, my friends, is when we start to convert some of what we hold in here into those other income producing assets, not now. Yeah, I, I so agree with you because part of, as you know, part of wealth is just like anything, patience, like a good marriage is patience and over time, right? It's it's a try, te, tried and tested proven thing. And, and so I agree with you. It reminds me a lot, Lynette, of, of 20, oh, the end of 2008 and the 2009. Do you remember that period when they said, hey, anybody with cash will get a great deal? I kind of see that, but on steroids, right? Because I agree with you. I think the real estate market is going to be between 80 and 90% because Who's going to be able to buy it unless you have this this position? So, with that in mind, Lynette, do you whether it's you know three months, six months from now, like you said, where you'll be able to get really good deals on land, housing, etc. Um, would you see a situation where where uh, contractors and or um, the the previous landowners you're buying the property from would take payment in gold and silver as opposed to just regular cash? Yes, I think it, it it's going to depend on how corporate they are, mm -hmm. because the more corporate they are, the less ability that they would have to do that. Mm. I definitely do see a time where the preference is going to be to be paid in gold, because it's going to be so obvious that if you're paid in dollars, those dollars are losing value instantly. So. Mm not going to want payment in that way. But if you are a large corporate structure, I don't know how many options you're going to have with that. Either way, for the holders of gold, then it's always easy to convert this into, it's the most liquid asset is gold and physical gold and silver. But it's it's so easy to convert this into whatever the currency happens to be. And, and mm. you know, you brought up the tokenization, so let's kind of go back to that for a minute, because the goal has always been, so I started talking about this in 2015, I can't believe it's been nine years already, but what they were talking about, and, and that is coming to pass, is holding all of your equity on your phone, I don't have my phone here, but holding all of your equity on your phone and having it broken down, tokenized, into bite-sized pieces like a dollar a piece. Mm -hmm. Now, how easy it is it to trade your equity all around the world, which is a bad thing and a good thing. It, it's a combination of the two, mm -hmm. but the encouragement in a consumer-driven economy, and I don't know that we're ready to be done with that yet, is to entice you to spend all your equity convenient it's right there you don't have to do a darn thing if it's all in token form okay i see this house or i see this boat or i see this blouse that i want to buy i have however much of my equity on okay that's easy the easier it is to spend your money the more likely you are to do it especially with perception management their term not mine which is guiding or their term again nudging you to do what they want you to do and all of a sudden you've spent all of your equity and you have nothing and i'm wondering if you're going to be happy conversely hmm. though if you are paying close attention to what's going on you could be one of the ones accumulating that wealth and those assets. And so it's a double-edged sword. You just have to be educated so that you know what you're looking at when you're looking at it. And you're in a position to take advantage of it, but you better be holding some wealth outside of this system. Because I know they'd love to tokenize all of it. 100%. And, and to your point, Lynette, looking historically in the Great Depression, almost, what, 95 years ago now, uh, there were still people forget there was a 1% contingency that did exceedingly well because they had the knowledge. We have an opportunity to do that now, but have more of a seat at the table, the more that we uh, stand up against it. And, and we don't, like you said, it's a peaceful revolution. We can just quietly fleece that power away from them by just taking ownership. So I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, last question for the day is the, the PE ratio, which you know well as S&P is normally around 15 to 16 historically. And one of our good team members is fairly high up at Schwab, kind of made me aware of being watching the S&P market. Uh, since 1929 till I think about 2019, roughly, it's been elevated to 35 plus both mm -hmm. times that a market crash ensued 
with a 50% correction by technicality. Uh, today's trailing PE ratio is 30. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think that we could see a 7,000 on the PE S&P ratio? Wow. Well, my thoughts on this, again, you've got like one of the, the most expensive, and I'm not really sure that you can even trust that PE ratio, to be honest with you. I think it's probably a lot more, a lot higher than that because of all of those severely underwater assets that a lot of these corporations are holding and sitting on and the levels of debt and leverage and the levels of zombie corporations that are out there, which are corporations that cannot pay the interest on the debt, let alone forget the principal for at least three years. Thank you, Japan. They showed us how to do it. And but we can't really see who those zombie corporations are. And we've got the grading services like Moody's and S&P that get paid by these corporations for their grade, right? Um, and, and holding so many of them in that triple B, that just barely investment quality, my God, I don't think that we're seeing anything with the true valuations of these markets. And I think, and there's a lot of hurting that's going on. There were, there were seven, I could be wrong on this because I don't have this in front of me, but I'll be reasonably close. In the, uh, in the S&P, I believe that there were only seven corporations that were actually truly profitable, um, 493, are struggling, but because of the hurting effect of those that are in power, and we all know them, you know, they're all the tech companies. There's Amazon and there's Meta and there's, you know, Google and all, all those seven. Um, so what does that say for what's gonna happen to the stock market when those go into full correction mode? because they're really the ones that push the index up. And much as you're listening to the talking heads applauding the broadening of the, of the stocks that are now participating in the rallies or the de declines, everything, all of those ETFs and those mutual funds that are built around those seven works great, makes the markets look powerful and wonderful on the way up, but it can also collapse the market on the way down. And once that momentum builds, uh, you know, and gets to a tipping point because of the doom loop, right? So in other words, so much of this was done on margin. In other words, borrowing to buy these stocks and push the price earnings ratio up and the visible price up. While the insiders, by the way, are getting out, thank you, read Jamie Dimon, right? read Mark Zuckerberg, right? you know, all those guys, they're selling into these highs. But um, what's going to happen to all of those ETFs and mutual funds that are concentrated in those seven tech companies? And once those start to get liquidated, then what they get is margin calls. In other words, you gotta come up with more money or we're gonna have to liquidate your position because those, those Wall Street brokerages, are, are that's what they're in business for. So now they have to start selling off those positions, which pushes the price down more, which means they have to sell off more to get those, to meet those margin calls. I mean, once once we build the momentum on that side, we are in such a vicious doom loop and it's already begun. It's already begun. We just can't see it yet. Or the most people can't see it yet. I think you guys are seeing it. Yeah, I'm just I'm writing some notes as you're you're talking because I fully agree with you. It's it's interesting when to your point, it's we would consider it sort of financial prestidigitation, sleight of hand. So you've got Japan buying gold. And yet they have a 22% currency devaluation. They're getting rid of our treasury bonds. Like you said about Japan, thanking them, showing us the way. You have China saying they weren't buying gold for two months, but we know that's not true. Um, we can see it because we see gold prices precipitously moving up. So money's got to be flowing somewhere. And you know that's for the purposes of themselves and BRICS. Exactly. And, and, and no gold leaves China 
and they mine a lot. So right, and they're getting into other markets like Zimbabwe to do mining, like you know, for that we talked about last time. And then also, you asked me a question earlier. I just wanted I was thinking about something you jogged my memory. You asked me about the BRICS summit in October, and if that would be you know just a formality. Iraq just announced that they're going to be fully digitized on the new gold token system because they hold a lot of gold as well in September. So to me, that would be sort of a foreshadowing of, of a hint of what might be coming in October. So, well, that, you know what? That would make me so happy. Me too. <laughs> gold standard. We need a more fair system. Yeah. You know, I mean, me, I'm old. I figure I'll be around another 30 years. But my kids, my grandkids, my great great grandkids that have not been born yet, if if we that are alive right now of all ages can stand up, come together in community, support each other and stand up and say, no, we want a seat at the table. We have to do this to have a component of sound money. But again, I always go back to, you know, I, I take it back to my father. And I know it always kind of makes him sound less than when I when I say this, but to me, he was absolutely the greatest man that ever lived. And he would say, he would say, do what I say and not what I do. It was typically around driving because he never looked behind. His bumper was always, didn't matter. He got the car today, boom, before the end of the day, his bumper was there. But that was kind of like our little banter word that really kind of put in my head that people can blah, 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 say anything. Actions speak so much louder than words. And we're watching global central banks buy more gold than they ever have in history. Mm -hmm. And to your point also, do you really think we know how much gold China and Russia or anybody or Saudi Arabia? I no. mean, there's a lot that's going on in Saudi Arabia and the petrodollar as well, right? But the petrodollar really hasn't been fully in place in a long time, they've accepted other currencies for it. But Saudi Arabia, I mean, if you stop and think about it, they have the influence of really that whole Gulf, Gulf area, right? And when you put their gold holdings with all of the other Middle Eastern gold holdings, that's a substantial amount of gold, but it still has to be convertible. It has to be convertible because mm -hmm. other way, otherwise, there's really no way for you as the individual to have any control or power or even know whether or not it's there. Right. Right. Agreed. Oh, one last uh, before we end, one, one last key point I just jogged, you jogged up my memory. Um, in terms of conversion and provability and testing in the system, also in September, XRP's Judge Torres has till September to render her decision, which I think we know where that's going to go. And that's going to send XRP moving, which will then move all the other arteries in the system. So I think that's kind of another sort of a hint of, of what we're looking for leading up to September, October and beyond. So um, last words you have for the audience and where can people find your work and how can they contact you directly? Well, you know, they can find all my work on YouTube and Twitter at the Lynette Zhang, Instagram and Facebook at Lynette Zhang, and of course our website, which is zhangenterprises.com. And then also we love the personal touch. So we love phone calls. And it's 833-GLD-ZANG, which is 833-453-9264. So yeah, I mean, we are all here to be of service. We have a sound money strategy based upon the historic norms, because whatever the new system is, you better have some sound money that will enable you to convert, not all, because who wants a full surveillance economy, but at least so that you have real wealth and real money that holds its purchasing power for you to shift into the new system and flip and take advantage of the opportunities that are going to present because wealth never disappears. It just shifts location. Mm -hmm. You have to have that wealth shift your way and you do that real simply. Hold your purchasing power intact. Yeah. 
Makes complete sense. Lena Zhang, always a pleasure to have you. Look forward to having you again in the near future. Thank you for your time and expertise, and we look forward to talking with you soon. I look forward to it, too, John. You take care. Take care.